Right, so, so today we'll, uh, we'll continue with the, uh, the discussion of trip steels. It will be very short, but what I, I have to say about trip steel, this is something important. Um, because trip steels are really clever materials. So we have, um, in, this, uh, in these strip steels, we have retained austenite phase. And this phase is thermodynamically not stable at room temperature. So there's a lot of driving force, thermodynamic driving force, to become martensite. Yeah? And um, so it's, it's stable at room temperature for for two reasons. Reason number one is its composition. Yeah. Its composition, we, we know that we can pump, uh, uh, during the Bainite transformation, we can literally pump up to 1% and more of carbon into the uh, austenite, the retained austenite as it is uh, as, as the steel is going through the uh, bainite transformation. And we can do this because, as you remember, of the silicon additions. But the other thing uh, that uh, keeps this phase from, uh, gives this phase uh, high stability is, is its, its size. It's, its size stabilized. When uh, retained austenite becomes very, very small, uh, literally uh, of mi submicron size, the MS temperature also drops. So when the size, so the diameter of the particle goes down, the MS temperature goes down very much. Uh, and the carbon content goes up, the MS temperature also goes um, down uh, very much. Um, the other clever thing that um, this uh, 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 retained austenite must have, yes, is um, it should transform to martensite, like at room temperature, right? Okay. Um, it's no good if it transforms at a very high temperature, or very low temperature. You want it to transform where you need it, at room temperature. Hmm? So, um, so room temperature transformation, it has to uh, give me this. And, and the other thing that it has to um, give me is strain-induced transformation. Hmm? So we want induced transformation. We, we want the margin side to form when we deform the material. Hmm? Okay. So what can happen to martensitic transformations, yes, in general, is temperature dependent, yes? Mm -hmm. So w you're all familiar with the concept of martensite star temperature, yes? But there are other martensite transformation specific temperatures, yes? In particular, when you look, when you add stresses and strains to the, uh, uh, to the retained austenite. Mm -hmm. so, and, and uh, by the way, this is, um, of course, this, uh, uh, we're discussing this for steels, but it, it works for any material, any uh, uh, material that undergoes a martensitic transformation. So you have uh, uh, titanium alloys, you have ceramics that uh, uh, have uh, martensitic transformation. All this, what I'm saying here is not specific to, to, to steel, it's specific to the martensitic transformation. So what happens when you apply a stress to uh, a material and you, you quenching it, you will find that the MS temperature goes up, right? And that's because the, uh, the elastic energy you, you uh, uh, 
give to the austenite phase by stressing it elastically adds to the driving force. So the MS temperature goes to higher and higher temperature. You don't really want the austenite to transform when you apply a stress, right? You don't want it to suddenly go become your trip steel to become a dual phase steel just because you add a little bit of stress. It's not very useful. You want the um, uh, uh, austenite to form martensite gradually as you deform the material. Yes. So, uh, so this brings us to the the situation of the MS sigma temperature. So, when I apply stress, yes, apply stress, the MS temperature increases. And the higher I apply stress, the higher the MS temperature moves up. At one point, I apply so much stress that the materials start to deform plastically first, yeah, before it transforms to martensite. Yes? And at that point, it's called MS sigma. So that's, that's the situation where uh, uh, the, the, this MS, the, temp uh, the stress dependence of the MS temperature cuts through the yield stress of the austenite. When your stress is so high, yes, uh, that the material uh, yields. Yeah? And that's the MS sigma temperature. And what, what we want yeah, is our austenite to, to form in those conditions. So we want the uh, uh, austenite to transform in a strain-assisted situation. So if I can, um, higher temperature, eventually uh, the austenite will not transform anymore, and that's the temperature is called MD. So what happens uh, here, if... Um, Get some pen here. Yeah. In this temperature range, yeah, the way the martensite forms is exactly the same way as the way it forms below the MS temperature. Yes? You just, by adding stress, you just add driving force, and so it transforms at higher temperature. So you basically get the same nuclei of martensite that are activated. Above the MS sigma, yes, you have deformation of the austenite, so you get dislocations, yes, and these dislocation interactions generate the, uh, the nuclei of the martensite. So we have first deformation and then gradually the formation of um, martensite when you strain. And so uh, you basically want uh, your, uh, your trip to, uh, and, and so, so the room temperature should be above MS sigma. Hmm? MS sigma. That way, when you deform your trip steel, it, it does um, transform the austenite, the retained austenite transform through strain assisted transformation. Hmm? And it so happened that you know the 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 austenite is designed yeah in terms of composition and size nicely to have an ms temperature which is slightly below room temperature it's between 0 and 10 degrees somewhere depending on the composition of your steel all right okay so we we discussed the alloying additions um with the trip steels, just as is the case with the dual phase steel, you can make a trip steel in a cold strip mill, but also in a hot strip mill. Yeah? Um, in this case, um, when you make the uh, transformation-induced plasticity steel in a hot strip mill, you start from the exit of the finishing in the uh, hot strip mill, yeah, you and you go into the um, 
runout table where you're going to do the transformations. Yeah? So what you do is you start exactly the same way as, the, uh, as you started for a dual phase steel. You're going to make a stepped cooling. So you're going to cool so that the strip is at the temperature where you form ferrite. Yes? And you let the step cooling go until you have about 50% of your microstructure is ferrite and 50% is austenite. Yeah? And then you do a rapid cooling yes, to the bainite transformation uh, temperature range. Hmm? So now this austenite here, which of course is enriched in carbon during the transformation, right? Because I'm in, uh, I'm uh, uh, partitioning the carbon to the austenite. I cool down now, and I transform this this austenite to carbon-free bainite in the coil. So I coil at. 350 to 450 degrees C, yes? So I don't turn it into martensite like I would do for dual phase steel. I cool to 400 degrees C so I get the bainite transformation happens in the core. Um, so what happens to the MS temperature of the austenite through this process? Well, you start with austenite which say has 0.2% of carbon when you come out of the finishing train, yes? Then the austenite is enriched in carbon when you're doing the step cooling yeah, here. Okay, so the MS temperature drops, yes? And as the bainitic transformation happens, hmm, the carbon content increases even further, yes? So you get a continuous drop in the MS temperature. Yeah? And eventually, of course, the MS temperature goes below room temperature and you basically keep this austenite with uh, over 1% in carbon stable at room temperature in your microstructure. Right, so these, these are, um, uh, so what, again, um, these are some um, uh, values in, in terms, so you have a relative idea of the, 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 the strength of the phases that are present. So if you look at the, the contribution to the strength of ferrite, you see that uh, the ferrite uh, strength is uh, not very high in the microstructure. With bainite, um, you have slightly stronger phase, mainly because you've got lots of dislocations in the bainite and a higher, a relatively high interstitial carbon, amount of carbon. The residual austenite itself is not a particularly um, hard or strong phase, but when it transforms, for instance, this, this would be the strength of the res residual austenite. When it transforms to martensite, it certainly turns into an extremely strong phase, yes? Because of the high carbon supersaturation. Hmm? How much uh, uh, retained austenite do we have typically in a trip steel? It goes from 10 to maybe 15% typically. You, you can make steels with much higher uh, retained austenite levels, but in, in uh, this particular example that we're discussing of, of low carbon uh, trip steels, uh, so about 10% to 15% of the volume is residual austenite. So the 
increase in strength, yes, due to the, the strip effect, yes, is uh, shown here. Mm, you get an increase about 200 MPa. Mm, that, that is due to the deformation, yeah. Basically, the, you, replacing, you replace this residual austenite phase by this very strong martensite phase, and you get this additional strength increase. Okay, and you, you don't, you do not only get an additional strength increase, but you also get an increase in the strain hardening. Hmm? So, if um, if you plot the n value, the n value of a high strength IF steel, and you compare it to that of a trip steel as a function of the, the true strain, you find for the IF steel you find this here. Yeah? I remember remind you of the fact that an IF steel is a, it's basically a ferritic steel. So we know that strain hardening exponents are typically 0.2, right? For trip steels, you can increase the value up to 0.3, which is considerable. Hmm? And as a consequence, yes, uh, so when the N value uh, is equal to the true strain value, so when we have this diagonal line. So when the n value cuts this diagonal line, uh, this gives me the position of the uh, uniform elongation. So I get an increase in the uniform elongation at the same time. So that's, that's what makes this strip effect so int intrinsically interesting and important. All right. Uh, so you can measure um, how your, your trip steals, uh, uh, the, uh, how, how the fraction of martensite changes as you strain the material, yes? At room temperature, for instance, here. Hmm? What you find is that it's very dependent, the, 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 the kinetics of the transformations depend very much on the composition of your, your, your retained austenite. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, for instance, if you have a carbon manganese silicon trip, you get a fast transformation, yes? If you replace now the silicon with aluminum, mm -hmm. instead of having carbon manganese silicon, you have a carbon manganese aluminum trip. I remind you of the fact that uh, silicon, aluminum, and phosphorus are three elements that suppress carbide formation, right? So, so you can replace all the silicon by aluminum, yes? What you see then is that the, uh, the transformation is much more, uh, is, is slower, yes? And is more spread out over the, uh, the deformation path. Right, so, so you don't need to, uh, to look at this uh, um, graph here. Hmm? So, and, and this, you know, what chemistry you use, and uh, there are many uh, uh, reasons to, to choose different chemistries. Uh, uh, and, and, and these are um, some, um, there are more details about um, alloy designs. But one of the important uh, points or problems that uh, happened when people started working on uh, trip steels yeah, is that in order to make a bainite free, excuse me, carbide free bainite, they had to add silicon. Yeah? And not, not, not a little bit of silicon, hmm? about 1.5% of silicon. Yeah? And um, it turned out that with these very high silicon levels, it was almost impossible to put a zinc coating on these steels. So you couldn't make um, continuously galvanized trip steels hmm, because these high silicon levels, yes, uh, you would have during the, uh, the processing in your galvanizing line, you would make an SiO2 surface layer. Yeah? Uh, and, um, and as a consequence, uh, the zinc would not wet these steels. The zinc would just form 
droplets of zinc on this surface. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why people had to tinker with the composition, uh, look into other elements such as aluminum and phosphorus to, uh, to, to still get this uh, carbide-free bainite, but the trip steels that were galvanizable. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, uh, these steels are now uh, standardized um, in uh, many um, countries. This, this is a European uh, standards for coated and non-coated uh, trip steels. Uh, you can see there's uh, high strengths here. Hmm? Um, uh, elongations are large, yes. And um, these steels, because of the high carbon levels uh, that they have, they also have a pretty important bake hardening uh, effect when you age them, when you do the paint baking. All right. So does it stop here? No, it doesn't stop here. Um, there are uh, indications that, uh, for instance, in the automotive industry, um, the car makers may be interested in, in steels with strengths up to 1.8 gigapascal, so 1,800 megapascal. That's very high strengths. Yeah? Uh, so, for instance, the typical lat Martin site um, has uh, 1.5 gigapascal of strength. Right? So you're talking about very strong materials, yes? And, um, and so there is a interest in continuing to develop uh, steels beyond the dual phase steels and the trip steels. Yeah? Uh, so how would you do this? Okay, well, very simple. Uh, get rid of the ferrite in your multi-phase steel, right? Because the ferrite is the soft phase, yeah? So if you remove it, you're obviously left with, uh, so if you remove all the ferrite in a DP steel, you're left with the martensitic steel. If you uh, uh, remove all the uh, ferrite in a uh, trip steel, you're left with bainite, yes? So, um, Obviously, working with Martin Sittic steel is a little bit of a challenge you know, because the material is very, very hard yeah, to process, but not with bainite. With bainite, um, you can uh, get uh, a material that's strong and formable. And so um, we have for strengths beyond the strength of, beyond the strength levels of um, dual phase and trip steels, we have ferrite bainite, ferrite plus bainite steels, or binitic steels. Yes? Again, um, we, and then there are also steels which kind of developed um, in parallel with these, and we call them complex phase steels. Uh, but let's have a, just this focus on phenite, uh, ferrite, bainite, and venetic steels, and see, for instance, how you would make these fully bainitic steels or these ferrite plus bainite steels in a hot strip mill. Uh, and I'll tell you in a moment why. Uh, there, there is interest in this kind of material. Uh, so how will you do a, a bainitic steel? Well, very simple. Again, um, you hot roll the material, yes? And then in your, uh, in your um, uh, line, yes? You, uh, you cool it down, yes? To have the bainite transformation. Yeah, so you have a step cooling to give you the bainite transformation. So there is not no intermediate cooling. You go straight to the temperature 
of the Bainite transformation, yes? And uh, because you, you uh, may form some austenite, uh, you have a, a drop in the MS temperature of uh, your um, austenite that's not transformed, and when you cool down, the microstructure of a bainitic steel may contain a certain amount, a certain volume fraction of retained austenite. Hmm? And so this is, would be in a, using a TTT diagrams to look at the process. And here on the, on the left, you see a phase diagram. So you start with a relatively uh, low carbon uh, composition. Hmm? Cool it down. Yes, and about <coughs> you keep the, the steel at about 400 degrees C, where you have the Bainite transformation continues until you reach the T0 line. Hmm? And then when you cool, there will be the, un the not yet transformed austenite will, um, will be stabilized at room temperature. You can uh, have a, uh, an additional amount of uh, ferrite in your microstructure, a small additional amount of ferrite in the microstructure by doing a stepped cooling. In this case, in the hot mill, you do the hot rolling. After the, when the strip exits the uh, finishing mill, you make a stepped cooling in the, uh, on the runout table, and then you cool to the coiling temperature, and that coiling temperature is, of course, your bainite. Uh, that's where you do the bainite transformation in the coiled material, in the coiled steel. Hmm? And, and so the, um, the carbon content, in this case, of the austenite, yes, during the stepped cooling, you will have an increase in the carbon content as, we as you get partitioning between the austenite and the ferrite phase. Yeah? And then when you cool down to the coiling temperature, the carbon content increases um, uh, during the um, bainite transformation. Hmm? And then when you cool it, your austenite is stabilized. So why... Um, what has um, been one of the drivers for this, uh, these um, type of materials? Um, and the, the reason is, uh, is uh, rather interesting. So first of all, uh, they give us higher strengths. That's one thing. The other thing that, um, that they do is... Um, when you start having materials with very high strengths, yes, some funny, and certainly when they're multi-phase uh, materials, you start to get funny press forming behavior. Hmm? One of the things is when you, you take a very strong material and you bend it, it gives you a lot of elastic spring back, right? And the, this elastic spring back is very important the stronger your material is. That's one thing. The other thing is, if you have a sheet, a sheet, yes. Um, usually, when when you make complex parts, yes, that part isn't made in one go. You, you, it's not like you pick, take a sheet and then you go into a press and then, kaboom, the the part comes out already, right? No, it's not. You, the part is progressively formed through transfer presses, yes. Uh, parts may be trimmed in, in between the, the, the forming steps. And very often there, are, there will be holes in the part, yes, during this process of stamping, yes. And these holes may be subject to expansion, yes. Or an edge may be uh, turned into a flange, yes. And it turns out what um, when you have, for instance, DP steel or trip steels, these holes, these flanges, very often crack. They crack open, and the reason is because the in these uh, trip steels and DP steels, uh, you get ferrite martensite interfaces. 
Yes? So ferrite martensite interfaces, very, you, you, you know there will be very important partitioning of stress and strain, yes? And it means that the ferrite strains a lot and the martensite doesn't budge, yes? As a consequence, at that interface, very quickly you get formation of voids, voids in the material. So you get uh, easier damage nucleation, yes? And that plays a very big role in, uh, in the process of this, the fracture of whole, ex in, in the case of whole expansion. So, of course, if you replace uh, the uh, microstructure uh, with just bainite, there is no uh, uh, strain in homogeneity. Um, or if you replace the ferrite martensite interfaces by ferrite bainite interfaces, the difference. Yeah, the, the, the strain partitioning is not so high, yeah, and you get a much better behavior. Hmm? So, um, and, and, and that is the reason why uh, uh, benitic steels, ferrite bainite steels um, uh, are uh, 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 formable, relatively uh, formable. Uh, high strength steels which do not give us these uh, fracture problems such as uh, in stretch flanging and in hole expansion. Okay, this is uh, uh, the structure of a typical ferrite bainite steel here. You see the, the ferrite phase and the darker phase is, is bainite. And this is an example here of a uh, hole expansion uh, uh, comparison of a trip steel, a DP steel, and a uh, ferrite bainite steel. So the, you see here the trip steel has this, this big crack developed here. Uh, there, the uh, DP steel has a crack here, running here, and the ferrite bainite is, is not cracked here. Hmm? So, uh, so the, the ferrite bainite steel uh, is, is better than, has a better whole expansion uh, behavior than trip and DP steels. Hmm? Uh, strengths levels are comparable to the, the, uh, those of uh, trip steels for the um, ferrite bainite steels. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, um, yes, 600 MPa. And the carbon levels are uh, also comparable to those of uh, bainitic steel. Hmm? Of excuse me, a dual phase steel. Um, properties, uh, not a very pronounced uh, 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 directional properties for a, a, a ferrite bainite steel. Uh, this is a complex phase uh, steel um, and in this case uh, we have a steel with a very small ferrite grain and then a complex mixture of bainite, martensite and retained austenite. So this, 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 this black here, yeah, base here. Um, and uh, basically CP steels are ferrite plus bainite steels. When you want to achieve higher strength, you typically have to add more alloying elements and uh, you, you don't get a very uh, pure and simple microstructure, basically. Um, and, and so that's why these steels are called complex phase steels. But in principle, they look very much, you know, from a physical metallurgical point of view, it's basically a ferrite, a, a, a grain refined ferrite plus bainite um, steel. A um, little bit higher strengths here, yes, uh, and um, 
you can see here uh, uh, these materials uh, don't have particularly high uh, elongations. Hmm? You see uh, 13 total elongations and, and homogeneous elongations are um, of the order of 10% um, at best. Hmm? Okay. Uh, these steels are, uh, um, have been around for a few years already. There are uh, uh, standards describing them. And, and typical strength levels go up to close to 1,000 uh, MPA uh, for the, uh, the tensile strength. Okay. So, so we see that um, you know, getting the higher strengths, we go from multi-phase steels and we remove the, the ferrite, basically. Uh, we know that martensite can uh, give us uh, very high strengths. So do people use martensitic steels? Yes, uh, yes uh, people make martensitic steels, uh, even in the form of sheet, yes. Um, but they tend to be extremely hard, of course, and you cannot really press form them. Yes? You, you can roll form them, yes? And certain companies are specialized in the production of um, uh, coils, big coils of uh, cold rolled uh, martensitic steels, very, very hard material. There is an alternative way to do things, however, yes? And, um, and that is, why not make the martensite when you're making the part? Hmm? And that is the, uh, the idea behind the hot press forming steels. Hmm? So in the hot press forming steel, you basically start off in your press shop with a ferrite plus perlite steel. Yes? Uh, that you can easily deform. And uh, you go from this, uh, so this ferrite plus perlite steel has typical properties in this range. Uh, so tensile strength around four or 500 and in elongation around 20, 25%, yes? So this material is now heated up to uh, 900 degrees C, yeah? so it turns into austenite, okay? It turns into austenite, a uh, very soft material, yes? At that temperature, uh, strength levels of around 100 MPA, elongations uh, 45, yes? So you can very easily press form this. And if you press form this in a clever way, yes? You can turn it into martensite while you press forming it, using the dyes as quenching dyes, as quenching media. The only thing you need to do is have water-cooled dyes. So you make sure that you, the, the, the dyes are very cold, yes? And you press form the material, yes? So you press form and you quench at the same time. The microstructure you get is martensitic, yeah? And so you end up with materials depending on composition and the way you did the process, which give you easily from 900 to 1500 uh, range of tensile strength. And of course you, don't, you get the elongation of a, uh, a martensitic steel, but the part is formed, so it's not a big issue. Hmm? Okay, so hot press forming is, um, is um, one of the new technologies where you know people uh, actually use uh, make parts that are fully martensitic, you know, very high strength, and uh, and use the formability of the high temperature austenite to uh, to to do the, the press forming. Right, and in in cars, the uh, uh, there is a big trend in using more and more high strength steels. And, but it's not only in cars that it's happening, it's happening for uh, the production of many vehicles, yes, uh, trucks, um, small fans, 
et cetera. And it, typically what we see is that uh, structural parts of a, a car body will be uh, made out of uh, high strength steel. So, so for instance here, Martin Sittix grade, yes, you can see uh, those are these uh, parts here and, and uh, here on the, uh, the other side of the car. Uh, and these are parts uh, which are called uh, the B-pillar reinforcements. Yes, and, uh, and they are used to protect you when there is a, a side impact on your car. They protect the passengers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it makes sense that you have this very, very uh, hard, strong material, uh, this column, yes, that, that protects you from uh, impact. Uh, and we call these anti-intrusion barriers, these, these parts. All right? Okay, right, and so there is uh, some information here on, uh, yes, and so we, we will um, we'll stop here. Um, there's some more material in the, uh, that I gave you, which, are, which is related to TWIP steels and QNP steels. This, this is uh, all very new. I, I, um, I, I just, um, you know, give you the slides. Uh, for the um, uh, just so you have all the information for future reference uh, if you're interested. Uh, the plan uh, for the The plan for the uh, coming uh, weeks, because I, uh, can somebody tell me when is the exam week? You don't know? I, 13th? 17th of June? And today is somewhere Fifth, so we still have so we 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 still have a classes next week. Uh, does that twelve? Yeah. Okay. Okay. As 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 we discussed uh, at the start of the uh, the semester, we we are not having the final exam. There will be a final quiz, and and that will be it, uh, basically. Huh? Uh, so the idea now is to uh, you know, continue um, with um, some other products. Yes, uh, we've concentrated on sheet products up to now. We'll uh, look into uh, wire and bar products. Uh, well, we'll start today and we'll continue uh, next time. And then we'll also talk about uh, the. Um, Uh, long long products, yes? There are a number of lectures in your, in your you know, the set that's online, course uh, material that's online, that's again, it's for your information. I think one is called structural steels, and then uh, there's another one um, where, uh, which is information about processing of a couple of structural steels and DP steels, some details about uh, their processing in the hot strip mill. We discussed the principle, so we, you, you know, you just have this material for um, future reference, uh, but it's, it's not going to be discussed in the, um, in the lectures now. So we'll just talk about, uh, so um, wire, and, uh, wire rod and bar products, and uh, we'll talk about, uh, as I said, long products. Mm -hmm. um, and if there is some time left, maybe we'll say a few things about electrical steels, although, um, although there, um, there is, I think, a course that's offered by GIFT on electrical steels. Um, 
but it might may be of if we have enough time we'll, we'll say a few things about electrical skills because that's a very also very specific type of uh, product okay so let's um, uh, start today or finish today rather with uh, wire rod and uh, uh, bar products and and see how these things are made hmm? and um, and what we make with these uh, uh, types of steels and these products. Hmm? So what is important is that these um, uh, bar mills and wire rod mills, they, they make semi-finished uh, steels. Yes? Um, and they end up in very many applications. Huh? Very many applications. Um, and uh, when it comes to... Uh, Wire, yes, the main product groups are tire cord. And if you don't know what tire cord is, that's what goes, that's the, the, the wire that goes into production of tires. Yeah? Um, uh, let me get my pen here. Um, cold heading quality steel. Um, what is a cold heading quality steel? The, uh, that is uh, steel that's used to make fasteners, nails, bolts, uh, bolts of all kinds. Um, those are made in um, uh, wire mills, this, the steel. Springs, of course, are also made by wire mills. Bearings uh, are produced uh, from uh, wire steel wire, and then you have also free cutting and free machining steels. Hmm? Uh, so we'll discuss the process yeah, of uh, you know, how these wires are made, how the bars are made, they're slightly different uh, products, yes? And, uh, and because they're semi-finished products, uh, what, what does that mean is that the, the product that the steel maker produces goes through one or two, three or more processing steps at the customer. Uh, obviously, POSCO, for instance, here, or other big steel makers, don't make nuts and bolts. You know, that's made by other companies. Yes? Uh, but the steel they provide to, these, uh, to their customers is very specific for the production of uh, nuts and bolts. Yeah? Okay, so we you, uh, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit of what happens at the users on the user side of these uh, materials. Um, how how big is uh, are, is wire relative to st uh, strip or uh, or plate? Uh, well, you can see it's it's a pretty big production volume, hmm? not as big as cold rolled or hot rolled strip. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you look at production of, of POSCO, which makes about, uh, in 2007, they made about three, 30 million tons of, of, of steel, yes? So you see that uh, the wire uh, can be uh, pretty important. Mm -hmm. Okay? The uh, way the, um, the wire uh, bar production starts is also the same uh, way uh, the, uh, the production of strip starts is by continuous casting. In this case, however, uh, our casters don't make slabs, but we, we uh, uh, cast, continuously cast billets. Mm -hmm. And here you see, and of course, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, always rather, uh, you have multi-strand casters. You have a, a caster which has about five uh, uh, st strands. Important in the, uh, in particular for wire, in terms of the metallurgy, yes, is the importance of cleanliness. Right? And uh, it's very well illustrated here, yes, that in inclusion, the presence of inclusions in wire is 
a lot bigger problem than the presence of an inclusion in, in a plate or in strip, yes? Because a small inclusion like this, yes, can break the wire, yes? Can be the source of, yes? So uh, there's been considerable, this is a, a considerable attention uh, on inclusion control and steel cleanliness in uh, wire production hmm? because of the, the, the impact a um, uh, inclusions can have on, on the properties. So what we see, hmm, for instance, um, if uh, uh, you can measure the impact of these inclusions, for instance, um, it, by measuring the fatigue life, yes? Uh, why would we be interested in fatigue life? Well, for instance, if you make wire for spring, yes? You, um, you know, your, if you have a suspension spring in your car or in a truck, you know, it has to work for uh, many years, and you don't want to have fatigue cracks that are initiated by inclusions, right? So one way to evaluate uh, this internal quality uh, is, is by looking at the fatigue life, yeah? And so here on the y-axis, we have a, a measure of the fatigue life. And, and here on the uh, x-axis, we have the steel oxygen content, meaning the, the, you know, the oxide content included in this. Uh, and we see that as, as we can reduce the amount of oxide inclusions, the, the fatigue life of wire goes up tremendously hmm? and all this evolution yes, is associated with better practice and more complex uh, secondary metallurgy degassing vacuum degassing continuous casting bottom tapping bottom tapping um, I don't know if I, I uh, that is what you, you can tap an electric arc furnace by just tipping it over. When you do that, there is there's a risk that uh, some uh, slag will be uh, will be included in what you what you tapping. So uh, nowadays they make electric arc furnace where you tap from the bottom. Yes. So there is no. Uh, or the risk of getting slag in your ladle is minimized, okay? Okay. So you need to have ultra clean steels and you also need to make sure that uh, this type of uh, oxide non-metallic inclusions are, are controlled, hmm? okay? Um, so as I said, you can um, uh, what, what feeds the continuous caster can be a BOF steel, yes, like uh, is shown here in this um, uh, schematic. But uh, a lot of uh, wire gets produced by uh, companies that have electric arc furnaces. Hmm? Um, so after the continuous casting, you have uh, again, a, uh, uh, if, 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 you, if your billet is not the right size, yes, you, you, you can go through a, a blooming mill, hot scarfing, and billet mill, yes, to get the right billets to start your uh, uh, wire production. Um, if necessary, these billets will be. Uh, ultrasonically tested to see if there are uh, uh, subsurface defect, yes? Uh, and then you go into basically the reheating furnace. And then what we see um, in the production of wire is similar but different from a uh, hot strip mill. You have, you get roughing mills, a roughing mill with different stands, intermediate mills, and then a, a finishing mill where you get the right uh, final dimensioning of your wire. And there is also an equivalent to the uh, runout table in the hot strip mill. You get a, um, a cooling section, a cooling bed here 
for, uh, and it's called a laying uh, uh, bed for the wire as it goes through the transformation. Okay, so uh, a typical uh, production company uh, that works with the electric arc furnace will produce about you know, close to 100 tons per hour, yes? So you're looking at about half a million tons of steel production a year, yes? And the billets will typically be, uh, you know, squares of about 12 centimeters by 12 centimeters. You know, slightly larger, slightly uh, smaller, yeah? And you, you can, um, the, the speed at which you typically produce wire or bar, yes, is, is very high, 100 meters per second, yes? Uh, for uh, thinner uh, wires and 20 meters per second if, if you have thicker wires and we call them bar uh, in coils, BICs. Uh, what are typical uh, sizes? Hmm? Well, wire rod that goes to five, from 5 to 20 uh, millimeters, bar will go up to 60 millimeters and a bar in coil up to 60 millimeters and, and then round bars which cannot be coiled anymore which are not coiled anymore can go up to uh, 85 uh, millimeters yes and a, a bar mill a wire and bar mill they usually produce the same mill that produces wire and bar in coil and bar uh, they will produce about 50 percent of wire 30% of bar in coil and 20% of, of bar. Mm -hmm. And also, there is, in, it, it, again, it depends on what the, um, the, uh, the client base is of the, uh, of the mill, but uh, typically you, 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 a, a wire mill will produce carbon steels and stainless steels. So this is again a, a, a um, some views of a uh, mill, typical mill. So you start with billets. They go into the reheating furnace here. Yes. Again, what are typical reheating temperatures? Well, between 1200 and 1300. That's just the same way you uh, reheat uh, the, the slabs. Mm -hmm. uh, the exit doors of these. Uh, uh, reheating furnaces are much smaller, of course, because they're, they're just long bars, so you don't need to have very uh, large, uh, wide doors in the reheating furnace, yes? And the reheating billet then passes through a number of uh, roughing uh, stands. Now, instead of having, uh, because you, uh, you make the billet uh, longer, Yes, um, if you compress it only in one direction, yes, it's not like a slab, which is a very wide. A billet is basically square. So what happens if I roll it in this direction? Yes, it will get, it will become like this, right? And if I continue rolling it, I'll just, I will not be making a wire. I'll be making a flat strip, right? So uh, that is the reason why the, uh, the mills that you get in uh, these wire and bar uh, mills are, oops, I'm over time, uh, are successions of vertical and horizontal uh, uh, stands. But we'll talk about this next time. So sorry I got over time here. Got carried away by exciting wire products. Okay. <laughs>